Distinguished Lecture on Disability. I want to start by announcing that there are ASL interpreters in the cart transcription up front. People who use them should feel free to move to the front seats, which are reserved for that purpose. This lecture series is organized by the Fordham Faculty Working Group on Disability, a university-wide group of faculty supported by the Provost Office. This year's lecture has also, also received support from Fordham's Chief Diversity Officer, Rafael Zapata. Uh, the Global Health yeah. The Global Healthcare Innovation Management Center, the Office of the Dean of the Law School, the English Department, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Many thanks to all these organizations. And I also want to give a special thanks to Dr. Sophie Mitra and Dr. Rebecca Sanchez, who are the co-chairs of the faculty, uh, Fordham Faculty Working Group on Disability. This lecture is part of a growing range of activities and initiatives around disabilities on campus. You can find out about the activities of the Faculty Working Group on Disability by going to its website. If you Google Fordham Disability Scholarship Cluster, you'll find it. In addition to this lecture series, there's an interdisciplinary research seminar, events organized for students, movie screenings, discussion panels, and so forth. The next event for students, by the way, is on April 25th. It focuses on technology, access, and design. The Faculty Working Group on Disability has also developed a proposal for a new minor in disability studies at Fordham College Rose Hill and Fordham College Lincoln Center. So stay tuned on this. And last but not least, there are new student advocacy clubs on disability. Flyers of the Students for Disability, disability Advocacy are available in the rotunda. The term itself, disability, can be ambiguous, even confusing. People in this room could probably define it in a variety of ways. For example, as an impairment, a health condition, or a form of social oppression. Often the definitions are negative and refer to limitations or losses. This is not surprising as the term itself has the prefix dis, meaning absence or negation. So it is important to build positive stories around disability. These positive stories have been factors of hope and progress, and they've helped us move from special schools to inclusive education, from segregated housing to inclusive communities. The 2018 Fordham Distinguished Lecture on Disability is going to introduce us to stories that expand the realm of the possible. Tonight's event is in two parts. The first part, until around 6 p.m., includes the lecture by Papa Nkirma, followed by a brief Q&A. Rebecca Sanchez will moderate this Q&A. Professor Sanchez is Associate Professor of English at Fordham. Her research interests include transatlantic modernism, disability studies, and poetics. She's the recipient of a 2015-16 AAUW American Fellowship. And her first book, Deafening Modernism, Embodied Language and Visual Poetics in American Literature, was published by New York University Press. The reception and main Q&A will be from 6 to 7 p.m. We invite you to have refreshments and time with friends and colleagues in the rotunda outside this lecture hall, and the main Q&A will be during that time. If you have a question or a comment for Robin, we invite you to line up and share it with her there. So now, it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker. We are delighted and honored to have Hava Nirma with us today to deliver the third Fordham Distinguished Lecture on Disability. Hava is a lawyer and is the first deaf-blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. She's a strong advocate for equal opportunities for people with disabilities. President Obama named her a White House champion of change, and Forbes magazine recognized her in Forbes 30 Under 30. Hava travels the world consulting and public speaking, teaching clients the benefit of fully accessible products and services. She's writing a memoir that will be published by Grand Central Publishing in 2019. Hava has been featured extensively in media around the world, including BBC, NBC, Forbes, NPR, and many, many more. Her lecture today is entitled, Disability and Innovation, the, Uni the Universal Benefits of Inclusion. Please join me in welcoming Robin Gerber.
many stories. She learned that America is the land of opportunity. America is a land of civil rights. Those stories inspired her to make the dangerous journey walking from Eritrea to Sudan. It took about two weeks. And then a refugee organization, a Catholic organization, helped her come to the United States. Several years later, older, wiser, my mother realized it's not geography that creates justice. It's not the land, the air, the sea. It's the people. It's communities that create justice. All of us make the choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, a black woman, disabled, lots of stories say my life doesn't matter. I choose to create my own stories. I choose to define what disability means. To me, disability is a powerful word. I associate it with civil rights, with the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm proud to be part of a community that advocated and obtained a powerful civil rights law. Congress passed the ADA in 1990. And people have different terms for disability. There's special needs. There's differently abled. There are euphemisms to try to get away from the negative stigma associated with disabilities. New words are going to get rid of stigma. It's communities that get rid of stigma. It's people choosing to be inclusive. So let's continue to use the word disability, but attach positive meanings to the word. There are alternative ways of doing things, and alternative techniques are equal in value to mainstream techniques. Gaining information through touch is equal in value to gaining information through sight, through sound, or through other means. Some people don't think so, but if we create communities, schools, where we believe that alternative techniques are equal in value, then our communities will be more inclusive. Next slide, I'm going to share our first video. We have a video of tactile sign language, and a young man is signing into my hands, and I'm feeling it and responding visually. Sign language is a form of innovation. If you can't access sound, if you can't access language through your ears, you can create and develop other ways to access language and engage in language. So deaf communities all over the world developed sign languages, and it's a form of innovation. In the United States, the dominant language is American Sign Language. In France, it's French Sign Language. Across the pond, in the UK, they have a completely different language, and it makes no sense to me. <laughs> It's called British Sign Language. So that's a form of innovation. And if one is deaf blind and can't see the visual language, deaf blind communities have developed solutions, tactile signing. One really cool thing about this video, this took place in Mexico at the Institute Technology. Instituto Tecnológico de Sonora, the Institute of Technology of Sonora, and most of the deaf community there did not know American Sign Language. They use their own sign language because different communities have different languages. And the young man happened to know both Mexican Sign Language and American Sign Language. So he was my interpreter helping me communicate with the deaf community. Deaf, can, deaf individuals can lead other deaf individuals. The blind can lead the blind. We need to change our stories and move to an environment where if someone says the blind leading the blind, it's not funny because we know and believe that of course blind people or deaf people can be leaders. 
Next slide. Another form of communication is dance, salsa dancing. And when I was growing up, I remember people assuming that I couldn't dance. I can't hear the beat in the music. Deaf individuals can sometimes watch other, deaf, uh, other dancers and see the beat, or they can watch the hands of the musicians and see the beat. Blind individuals can hear the music and dance to the music. I don't see other dancers and I can't hear the beat of the music. So I use touch. And when I dance with people, they communicate musicality and the beat through the signals, through the dance. There are some signals in salsa dancing that are visual. And people who dance with me make the choice to be inclusive and convert those visual signals to tactile signals. So I can so we can continue to participate in the dance. Access is all about communities and communities choosing to be inclusive. I travel with a guide dog. I don't have a guide dog with me at the moment. She's in California. She's not feeling very well, so she wasn't able to travel on this trip. But she's been all around the country with me. And the salsa community in DC refused to give us access because they didn't think a dog could come into a salsa place. And I told them the Americans with Disabilities Act allows access wherever the public can go, guide dogs can go. And they left us out in the cold. It was very frustrating. They assumed that people with disabilities could dance, and they assumed that uh, a guide dog, well-trained dog, wouldn't behave at a guide. <laughs> My interpreters are just telling me there was banging outside. So I can dance, but sometimes communities create barriers, and it's up to communities to choose to remove those barriers, whether it's a salsa community or a university. We all need to choose to be inclusive. And when I was in college, I asked myself, what can I do to be inclusive? I don't just want to tell other people to be inclusive. I want to be an advocate and make change too. I went to Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. It's a small school. And the cafeteria served as a central place for students to hang out and relax between classes. It was a large room. When you walk in, along three of the walls were large windows showcasing Portland's green. <laughs> Along the fourth wall were food stations, and students would walk in, browse the print menu, and then go to the station of choice. I couldn't access the menu. Blindness wasn't the problem. Blindness is never a barrier. It's communities that create barriers. So I went to the cafeteria manager and I explained the situation. I said, the format of the menu is not accessible. Could you provide it in another format, like Braille? Or maybe you could email it. I'm able to access computers using assistive technology. So if it was emailed or put up on a website that, that's accessible, then I can access it. They told me they're very busy and I should stop completing and be more appreciative. I don't know about you, but if there's a chocolate cake at Station 4 and no one tells me, <laughs> I don't feel appreciative. Back then, I was a vegetarian, and it's hard to eat vegetarian if you don't have access to the food information. Sometimes I'd wait in line for 20 minutes, get food, find a table, try the food, and discover an unpleasant surprise. It was very, very frustrating. But I told myself, at least I have food. 
Lots of people all over the world struggle for food. Who am I to complain? My mother was a refugee in Sudan when she was 18. Who was I to complain when I had access to a university, when I was getting an education in America? The school was also doing a really good job providing me all my textbooks in Braille. Lots of blind students in other schools struggle to get access to their books, and that forces them to fall behind. Who was I to complain? So, for several months, I didn't do anything about it. I tried to just tolerate the situation. And one day, I was talking with my friends, and they reminded me, it's my choice. It's our choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. The little barriers add up. When we practice advocating against the little barriers, we build up the skills to address larger obstacles. If we want to shatter the glass ceiling, if we want to shatter the glass ceiling, Thank you. Um, if we want to shatter the glass ceiling, we need to work on our own skills of removing all these barriers and, and not leaving any barrier behind. So I decided to work on making my own community more accessible. And I went back to the cafeteria manager. This time I framed the issue as a civil rights issue. The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. And organizations serving the public, like that cafeteria, are required by law to be inclusive. After framing the issue as a civil rights issue, everything changed. They started providing the menu in accessible formats. Life became delicious. <laughs> The following year, a new blind student came to the college, and he didn't have to fight for access to the menu. The culture had changed. They started providing accessible menus at the cafeteria, and that made me realize that when I advocate, it benefits our whole community, and I wanted to make that into a career and use my time here to advocate and make life better for, for not just me, but our whole community. Next slide. I have a photo from Harvard Law School, and I was the first deaf blind student to go to Harvard Law School. Harvard told me we've never had a deaf blind student before. And I told Harvard, I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> we didn't have all the answers, but we figured things out. We tried one thing. If it didn't work, we tried another thing. It's okay if you don't have the answer. As long as you're trying and engaging in an interactive process to find solutions. And as a deaf-blind person, I often find myself in these situations where I'm the first person there, and I need to be innovative and come up with unique solutions to figure things out. Harvard wasn't always inclusive. When Helen Keller was looking for colleges to attend, Harvard wouldn't admit her, because back then, Harvard only valued men. Helen Keller was brilliant, incredible, amazing. Her disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that practiced exclusion. It's really all about communities. I'll give another example. Helen Keller's community wouldn't allow her to experience marriage. Disability doesn't stop people from feeling love and having relationships. Helen wrote extensively about love. 
She fell in love, secretly got engaged, but her family forcibly prevented her from marrying the person she loved. It's all about communities. We've come a long way since Helen's time. Harvard eventually made the smart decision to open its doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. There's still barriers at Harvard, and there's still barriers at other places. I want to ask people here to think about what are some of the barriers at Fordham University. And think about what you can do to remove those barriers. Because it's up to communities to make a choice and commit to inclusion. At the end of my talk and our presentation, we're going to ask people to write down one thing you commit to doing to make Florida University more accessible. It could be removing a physical barrier that blocks access for someone who uses a wheelchair. It could be holding clubs and social events at accessible places, or get, getting access to interpreters for everyone. So think about what you can do and plan to write it down at the end of the presentation. On screen, we have a photo where the dean of Harvard Law School is handing me a diploma, and the dean and I are wearing academic regalia, and my guide dog, Maxine, is wearing a fancy fur coat. <laughs> well, what I did is called image description, and image descriptions help blind people access images. There's another benefit. When you add image descriptions to your photos, more people access your content. Not just blind people, but also non-disabled individuals. Because when you add text to your content, you increase search engine optimization. So your audience grows. Same thing with captions and transcripts. When you add captions and transcripts to your videos, podcasts, <coughs> radio programs, more people will find your work, both in the non-disabled and disability community. Next slide. There are lots of benefits to choosing inclusion. Increasing content discoverability is one. Another one is reach. There are 57 million Americans with disabilities and 1.3 billion people with disabilities around the world. So you reach more people when you choose to be inclusive. You reach more students here. I saw a survey that said that 6% of Fordham University students have disabilities. So you reach more people and also prospective students and information you want to share with the greater public outside of the university. So a larger audience. Another thing that people often don't know is that disability drives innovation. People with disabilities are often coming up with solutions. For me personally, as a deaf-blind person, I had to come up with a system of using this keyboard and rail display so I used it to connect with people. And at the end of this talk, you'll be able to use it too. We're going to do questions and answers where people can type and ask their own questions. So I want you to think of awkward questions, <laughs> difficult questions, tricky questions to, to ask me. Because this is your opportunity to learn more about disability. Another thing to keep in mind is legal requirements. There are legal requirements to choose inclusion. And all these business reasons should be persuasive enough. But if it isn't, there's legal requirements. So know that you have options. You have lots of tools for making your school more accessible. I want to show a short video that shows more about how people with disabilities use technology, specifically the blind community. The next slide.
lots of people who would assume that blind people would never take pictures, so why bother making camera apps and photo apps accessible to people with disabilities? We do take pictures, so don't make assumptions about what people can or can't do. When you're developing new ideas, new programs, new technologies, design with access in mind so everyone can use them. Next slide. Look around your community, identify barriers, and make a commitment to do something about at least one thing, one thing that you commit to do to making Fordham University more accessible, or your own community if you're not based here at Fordham, to be more accessible. For digital services, use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or Android or Apple Accessibility Guidelines to make your digital services, the school website, apps, that sort of thing, are accessible to everyone. Increase hiring of people with disabilities. Make sure that services are accessible to students with disabilities and teach your communities about inclusion. Share this information. And next slide. When you choose inclusion, you role model inclusion for other people. We have a photo where President Obama is standing at a table typing on a pretty keyboard, and I'm reading from my Braille computer as he's typing. President Obama usually communicates by voice. When I met him, I explained that I'm deafblind and I access information best through touch, through Braille. He gracefully switched from voicing to typing so that he can be accessible and inclusive. So when you choose inclusion, you role model inclusion and you influence other people to do the same and also be inclusive. So make a commitment to do at least one thing to make your communities more inclusive. And next slide. So this slide has my contact info. My name is Havan Verma. Oh. Um, my interpreter just said picture, and I thought, there's a new picture on my slide? But I think they meant that someone's taking my picture. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. So um, my contact information is up here, havengrima.com, or you can follow me on social media. Thank you, everyone.